Welcome back to the Tax Advisor and Biz Coach Success Podcast. The purpose of these episodes is to help entrepreneurs become more successful, avoid tax and other business headaches. Remember to tune in frequently as we will be sharing tips, secrets, and expert recommendations on how you can manage your finances, improve wealth, and grow your business. Please like, share, and subscribe. Here's your host, Liz Soria. Hello, folks. It's Liz Soria here at the Tax Advisor and Business Coach Success Podcast. Um, Today, I have a really incredible guest who's joining us and I'm very, very honored that he's taking his you know, time to be here with us. Um, his name is Richard Chapo and he's actually a business attorney for specializing really for online business. And I think that's really important because as you know, we do deal a lot with e-commerce business. So today's topic, we're gonna to talk about why the California new privacy laws matters to online business. And I know some of you might not be familiar, have no clue about this, but that's why I brought Richard. Uh, he is an attorney, and Richard, welcome to our show. And how are you, sir? Well, thank you for having me on. I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing very well, too. Thank you. I'm going to try here to share, for those who are watching a webcast through a YouTube channel, I'm going to try to share a, a picture of uh, Richard, um, since we really do an audio here, but I am doing the video side. So for some of you in my YouTube channel that like to be watching the interviews instead of just listening to it. Um, other than that, uh, Richard, please uh, kind of jump in. Give us a little bit of your expertise and your background um, and what makes you qualified to really not only discuss this topic, but to really help the audience because I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to uh, setting up legal entities and what might be a good choice and with all these changes happening? Sure, sure. Uh, I've been practicing over 25 years, uh, all of it in California, and um, started out in the 90s actually doing litigation defense, a lot of wrongful death, uh, things of that sort, um, complex litigation. Then uh, around 1999, uh, went overseas for a sabbatical uh, in Russia of all places, came back, and uh, this hot new commercial medium called the internet was rolling. I had a friend who had become a CEO of an internet company, and uh, he was looking for legal counsel at that time. Everything was pretty new on the legal front. And so, um, you know, he asked me to do it. And so I've been doing it ever since then. Obviously, the first couple of years were uh, quite a learning experience and trying to understand, you know, the new technology as well as, you know, how basic things like copyright and trademark would apply and, you know, was linking legal and all those kinds of things. Um, and from a legal perspective, it was interesting because uh, these days you rarely kind of find a new field where, um, you know, there really is no legal standard. And so, you know, many people, older people obviously would think of it. Um, you know, back then it was known as a wild, wild west on the internet. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, we're kind of seeing it go the other way now. Uh, I refer to this time as the empire strikes back. We're seeing a lot of governments coming in and issuing laws and rules and what have you. Um, they're making things a little bit more complex. But that's how I got into it. I've been doing it since, uh, yeah, basically 2000. Um, I represent companies, large international companies, but uh, primarily smaller e-commerce, smaller bloggers, those kinds of people. Uh, and my practice is really devoted to trying to keep them out of trouble proactively versus reacting once they've gotten a nasty letter from somebody or something of that sort. doesn't always work, but at least that's the goal. At least we try. Yes. <laughs> that's all we can say, right? Because you try, uh, as an attorney, you try to establish, I guess, the proper entity and, and guide them through the process. And then I'm on the other side trying to guide them a little bit on how to save money in taxes. And to- yes, uh, absolutely. You know, for me, from the entity standpoint, it's really, I tend to look more towards the tax side of it. Um, yeah. You know, in relation to who's going to you know benefit from what type of structure. For me, from the legal side, it's not so much the entity itself as it is the um, you know, the initial. Hi, Richard. I think for some reason I lost you. Whoop, looks like we cut off. Yes, we did, but we can get started again. That's not a problem. Okay, Richard, so we did have a little bit of a technical issue there. <laughs> Today's <laughs> been a, a very challenging day for some reason. <laughs> it's just <laughs> Not behaving well technology with me today, but that's okay. That's not going to stop us, right, Richard? Uh, so, uh, Richard, let's dive in a little bit with this um, 
you know, the California new privacy uh, uh, laws because it's very confusing. Uh, are they trying to do something similar to the GDPR, which is in Europe with the privacy laws? Is that what California is trying to do something, kind of play similar role? Uh, yes, very much so. Uh, to understand what's going on, you kind of have to step back first uh, to understand that different jurisdictions have different views towards privacy. The United States is what's called an opt-out jurisdiction, which means people can collect your information online, companies, what have you, unless you affirmatively opt out unless there's very specific situations such as we're talking about children uh, or health records, something of that sort. The U.S. doesn't have a general privacy law. Um, in other areas and other parts of the world, privacy is viewed a little more importantly in the European Union. It's one of the principal um, elements of their charter. Okay. So it has the equivalent value of, uh, let's say, free speech here. They, they take it much more seriously than we do. Yes, they do. Yeah. So in, uh, in the EU, in 1995, they, they issued their first privacy directive. Uh, the member states all passed laws supposedly supporting it. As you can think, as you may remember, the Internet in 1995 wasn't exactly well developed. So there were quite a few loopholes. And one of the loopholes was that if you weren't physically located in the EU, more or less, you didn't really have to comply with the law. Um, well, if you think about the internet, I mean, if you have an e-commerce store and you're selling soccer jerseys for the teams in Europe and you're located in Chicago, you know, shouldn't you really need to comply? A lot of people thought yes, but under the old directive, you didn't. Um, so over six years, four to six years, depending on how you calculate it, the EU struggled to come up with a new law and they finally issued this new regulation. Uh, the General Data Protection Regulation went into effect in May. And um, it's, it's, you know, a whole different bowl of uh, Cheerios, if you will. It um, basically requires that you have a legal basis to collect information. And it gets rid of the international uh, loophole to some extent. Not as much as you hear people um, comment on online. Um, a lot of people I don't think they really understand that aspect of it. But what it did was it shifted all the power to the consumers. And so it gave, gave consumers the ability to essentially control their um, you know, their information and how companies are using it. And um, it's, it's pretty burdensome, but um, what eventually happened was is there was a, hello? Are we still there? Yeah, I'm still here, just a moment. Oh, okay. It's okay. I wanted to ask you in regards to what is um, the actual uh, steps that e-commerce business need to do in general to be able to be compliant? With the GDPR or with the California law? I almost lost you there again. Sorry, Richard. Um, with in, in general, when it comes to, you know, what what kind of structure do they need to have? Some sort of a, a legal disclaimer or things like that to have on their websites in, in, in their you know uh, printing material. Uh, is that necessary with this new uh, new law, or is it still under revision? And obviously, some other changes can happen. Uh, with the GDPR, or with the California law. I'm sorry, with the California law, Richard. Right. So the California law. Um, what happened was, is there was a developer in San Francisco who uh, was a big fan of the GDPR. And in California, as long as you have some money, you can get initiatives uh, put on the ballot. Is that true? Right. And so, you know, if you're in California and you go to a grocery store, there's always people out front asking you to sign petitions, and this is what they're doing. Uh, and so he put up a law that was very similar to the GDPR. And because it was going to cause chaos under California law because of the way initiatives are handled, um, and it was obvious it was going to pass, the government here um, went ahead and actually made a deal with him. And they said, we will go ahead and enact a new law that basically follows these, these principles that you have, but it will be different so it doesn't conflict with other California laws and things of that sort. So the GDPR took four to six years to put together. The California law took seven days. Oh, what? Is that true? Seven days yes. versus two, four or five years? Goodness. So as you can imagine, the law created in seven days, that's 10,000 words, uh, has some problems with it. <laughs> and um, so what we're seeing is revisions to it. Uh, the California Attorney General is charged with uh, issuing regulations. They have issued no regulations so far. So what we are seeing is uh, it doesn't go into effect until January 1st, 2020. However, there's a 12-month look-back period. And that means January 19, uh, 2019, you need to start being concerned about it. The look back period is um, one of the requirements that you must tell, uh, you must be able to tell people um, how you collect and use their information and who you share it with during the previous 12 months. 
Um, so a lot of people are looking around trying to figure out how they're going to do that. If you are GDPR compliant, it's actually not that difficult because you're kind of already doing it. Right. Um, so it is something there. To your question of does it require specific disclaimers and things of that sort, does it, it requires have? right. It requires a whole new privacy policy. Basically, you're going to go through and you have to do disclosures about uh, everything from you know the consumer's rights to um, you know how they can request these changes and what have you. Again, we don't have a ton of specifics because we're still waiting for the attorney general. Um, but the California law may not apply to you. Uh, one of the fundamental differences between it and the GDPR, which is a, a huge advantage in California, is it says thresholds. There are three thresholds. Uh, if you don't meet any of the thresholds, then you don't need to comply with the law. Oh. So the first threshold is if you have $25 million uh, or more of revenues. So if you don't have $24, $25 million of revenues in a year, you, know, you, you don't meet that threshold. Second one, unfortunately, is not, not as um, helpful. Um, if you have less than 50,000 visitors in a year, so that's about 4,100 unique visitors a month. Um, if you don't have that many, then you don't meet that threshold. And then the third one is do you derive 50% or more of your revenue from, shelling, from sharing the personal information that you collect? Um, so for a general e-commerce uh, site, you're probably going to be fine with that. The, if you're in a situation where you're developing leads and selling leads to other people, eh, you probably have a problem there. Um, so those are the three thresholds. And again, there's going to be all kinds of litigation over exactly what they mean. But if you don't hit any of those three thresholds, then you don't need to worry about the California law. Now, if you do hit them, you're getting more than, you know, if you're getting 7,000 unique visitors a month or something of that sort, you know, then you do need to go ahead and comply. And the compliance process is basically going to be yeah, creating a new privacy policy, but then you're also going to have to have internal procedures. If somebody requests to know, you know, all the information that you've collected on them, mm -hmm. uh, well, how are you going to identify that? How are you going to produce that? And you have to identify and produce not only the information you collect, but you're responsible for your vendors. Oh, no. You must, yes. Are you serious about that? They're making, they're making really the company responsible for the vendor side too? Yes, and the GDPR does that as well. So, okay. and a lot of these, the benefit in an odd way is that because the GDPR came along, a lot of your vendors are already getting into the process of complying with that. They're already I setting up processes because they're worried about the GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, so although it sounds like a horrible thing, uh, you know, it isn't necessarily there. So if you go to Google, for instance, um, you know, Google has uh, what they call data processing agreements. Uh, Google has one and they'll just punch it out to you. Um, you know, so will a lot of the, the transaction companies. The problem we run into, um, you know, depending on how you build your site, um, the people that write these laws, they've never built sites before and they don't really seem to understand that a lot of sites are very module in nature. So you take a WordPress site or something like that and you're slapping plugins on and shopping carts and what have you. You know, you can have a ton of, a ton of vendors. And, and they don't seem to understand this. And so, you know, the compliance process can become a, a bear, uh, you know, to say the least. But that's generally where it is headed. You know, you're going to need to at least go through that threshold test, make sure, you know, that, that you either don't comply or if you do comply, you know, then get, gain an understanding of what's required. And I'm sorry to interrupt there, Richard, and I just kind of want to bring up, a, 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 you know, an issue here is uh, I did notice that since the uh, GDPR that, you know, uh, process and, and it's been implemented in Europe, I mean, uh, I, I notice a lot of American companies really taking that approach here in the United States too. And I think this is way before even the California, uh, you know, privacy law came along, uh, which I think was back in what, June, July of this year, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But a lot of these companies, they're doing that already. They, they're actually implementing stricter, you know, privacy policies. And I think that's great. Hello. I think we cut out again. I hear you, Richard. Go ahead. Hello? Yep, I hear you. You're back. <laughs> You're back. Richard? I guess I lost Richard again. I think we're cursed. <laughs> Richard, seriously, I'm concerned, and you know what? We just got that recorded, but that's fine. That way, the audience know <laughs> there's something uh, strange going on. <laughs> Election day, <laughs> right? But we can keep going. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you were you were asking about the companies. You know, it seems like U.S. Uh, companies are already going in that direction. And a lot of the larger companies, in particular, are because. 
um, you know, it's just easier financially uh, and from a systems perspective just to set up one system um, so they don't have systems for different areas. Um, it, it just makes more sense from an efficiency perspective. Now, other companies are going the other direction. Some are just blocking Europe. I mean, it's something that people need to think about. There's a concept called the splinter net. Uh, and that basically says that, at least from an economic perspective, the internet is being divided up into different regions and because there are just different requirements. Yes. And, and for some you know, companies, it's going to make economic sense to look at their numbers and determine if the return on investment for complying versus the revenue they're generating makes any sense. Um, so if you're a U.S. company, uh, let's say you, know, you have a small company and you're doing a dating site or something of that sort, it's probably a bad example, but let's say California dates or something like that, mm -hmm. and you have two people from Europe, well, do you want to spend 10 or 15 grand complying you know, for that $80 in revenues that you're pulling in or whatever the number is? Um, you know, so you need, to, you need to start thinking about that as, as somebody who's running an economic entity online. Um, which is unfortunate because that wasn't what we thought the internet would originally be. Um, but at least from an economic perspective, we're certainly headed in that direction. And in fact, when the GDPR hit on May 25th, you know, a, a large number of newspapers in the U.S., including the L.A. Times, blocked Europe. If you were in Europe, you cannot pull up the L.A. Times website. Is that right? Okay. Right. And large retailers did as well. Dick Sporting Good, um, you can't see that in Europe. And the reason being that the compliance process is not only... Um, uh, expensive, but the GDPR is horribly written, extremely vague in certain areas, and the penalties are massive. They can be up to you know, roughly $24 million. Uh, and the problem is that your insurance, your liability insurance, does not cover regulatory fines. So you're on the hook for that money. And you know there are a lot of enforcement groups. Each member state has a, what's called a supervisory authority. They're basically the enforcement agency, kind of like the FTC here. And some countries have supervisory authorities that are, um, you know, they're easy to work with. So, for instance, the UK has the ICO. The ICO rarely issues fines. They, they're more interested in making sure that you get in compliance and, and, you know, meet the requirements so the consumers benefit. The enforcement groups in France and Germany, they will find you right and left. Um, they're, they're very aggressive. Um, you know, the, the groups that you see going after Google and finding them billions of dollars right and left, well, that's their mentality there. So do you want to get dragged into any of that? So there are a lot of different questions that are arising that unfortunately people need to think about. Um, you know, now, yeah. you, know, you know, there's also the... Not next week, now. <laughs> and I was... Right, right. You know, and there's the fundamental question though, you know, are they going to come across the border for somebody who has, uh, you know, nominal sales? Uh, you know, you can do your own risk analysis there, but there's a certain amount of common sense. Yeah, Richard, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt there, but I mean, you mentioned the threshold's pretty high. I mean, $50 million? Is that? Well, for the California law, yeah, $25 million. So that one that one is fairly high. Uh, unfortunately, the other two thresholds aren't very high. No, they're not. Um, you know, the That's traffic. That's 22. <laughs> it is. It is. Because if you, you know, if you think about 50,000 visitors a year, that sounds like a lot. Wow. But when you break it down on a month, you know, that's, that's not really not. Uh, and there's even questions as to what is a visit. Is a visit just one person or is it from a device? Sure. Um, so if a person, yeah, person accesses from their smartphone versus their PC, is that too? And especially the fact that now everybody is advertising or they're exposing their, their services or their products across the board, meaning that they're going to different social media. So you're getting all this traffic from different platforms. So. Right. That threshold, I think, is quite feasible for someone, even a, a, a quite even a considered small company, to reach in a year. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, and so it's it's one of the things we were hoping that we would see. <clears throat> excuse me, that number bumped up a bit when they were doing some of the revisions to the law. Unfortunately, to this point, it just hasn't happened. Um, now, the Attorney General in California is uh, the group that's going to primarily be charged with enforcing this. The original penalties were going to be seventy five hundred dollars a violation gone down to $2,500 in the latest round. Um, but you, know, you have to remember with privacy violations, that violation is per person. So it's not your per act. So if you have, <laughs> yeah, it can be, it can be pretty large. Now the good news in all of this, and it's more of a hunch than anything concrete is the California attorney general's office does not appear to be particularly enthusiastic about this law. Uh, so I was telling you earlier, it goes into effect in January 2020. Uh -huh. They have now said that they may not even issue regulations until six months after January 2020, until the summer of 2020. Uh, 
okay. which is raising all kinds of interesting questions about, well, okay, how do you enforce a law that has no regulations? I agree. You know, what are we supposed to do to plan for it? And um, so you get all these issues. And how can you prepare your clients to, comp- you know, to have a compliance with this new law when it's still like, you know, up in the air? I mean, how, how can you do your service? I mean, as an attorney, uh, I don't, that's my part where, you know, right. Yeah, I think you hit the general, you know, the general points of the law, and then there's a lot of wiggle room, basically, to argue about it. Um, you know, the California Attorney General, it, it's California Attorney General's office is very politicized, so it just kind of depends also who's going to be in office at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had a, you know, Attorney Generals in this state in the past that were uh, very aggressive uh, privacy issues because California does have a number of privacy laws, and then we've had some that you know couldn't spell privacy if you spotted them the p and the r um so it just it just kind of depends but you know that is at least something out there if you're listening right now and you're you know you start starting to panic about this kind of stuff you know do keep in mind it doesn't go into effect until january 1st 2020 and you do need to start thinking about it because the 12 month look back period um but you know it, it isn't a situation like the gdpr where that, that's already you know a fact um and you're gonna have problems with that one you know if you're not in compliance um, so there is time to go through these things and look at it. Uh, and again, you know, I think that we're generally kind of moving in that direction. We're also seeing some crazy things come out. Um, there's an effort now for federal privacy law in the U.S. The tech giants have kind of seen the light. They realize, okay, this battle's kind of over. So what do we do? So they've been trying to introduce bills that are very, um, very soft on privacy, but we would have privacy requirements nationally. It'd be kind of a GDPR light. Um, but we're also getting, you know, there's a senator in Oregon that just issued a bill and he is um, on the privacy. So it would be a national privacy law. I don't know the specifics of it, but it would have a criminal aspect to it. So that if companies did not comply with the law, the CEOs could go to jail. Oh, um, now we're getting really serious here. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And most people picture CEOs, you know, the CEO Goldman Sachs or something of that sort. But if you have an e-commerce business and you have a business entity, your CEO, That's welcome, right. congratulations. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so there, you know, I, I you got a fancy hard. title, whether you like it or not. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Senior <laughs> executive bartender. Um, yeah, I, I have doubts that law will actually, or that bill will actually make it to law. But you know, you, you're seeing kind of some strange things come through. So I suspect in the next year or two, we will actually have a national privacy law, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what effect that has on state privacy laws. Well, one of the things I'm definitely glad that you're here, you know, uh, sharing all this wonderful information with us so valuable because, like I said, one of my niches actually is e-commerce. And as you probably have heard, not only we're dealing with all these privacy laws coming into place, but also the sales and the nexus tax. And it's so much, I mean, I hate to say it, but online businesses are getting hit so hard um, that it's hard for them to, to, even when they have good intentions, right? to stay compliance with all these changes. There's so many going on um, that I tell them the best they can do is not to do it themselves, you know, approach. It's really finding, uh, you know, the support that they need. That way, when these laws take an effect, you have someone that you can reach out and say, okay, I need help, um, set me up, do my privacy policy. I wanna make sure. And you brought something that I wanna kind of reiterate that is a part of, you said that insurance don't cover for these kind of things, uh, what can then uh, companies do to cover their, you know, their behind? Just to say in a nice way. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, that, that is the $15 billion question is, um, you know, you can look at your policies and talk to your brokers. I have been able to get policies where they will at least pay the defense costs. Um, but, you know, insurance companies are mathematical creatures. They're working off of an algorithm and they're projecting, you know, actuarial tables and what have you. The GDPR is a new law, um, and so they they have no idea how it's going to play out any more than anybody else does. Um, but traditionally, they haven't covered any kind of regulatory fine anyways. And the reason for that is really that, you know, government agencies tend to be um, slow movers, but once they get moving in your direction, you know, those cases can roll for 10, 15 years because there's no financial restrictions on the government from t- continuing to pursue them. The FTC just went through a case where they, they pursue, uh, pursued the uh, uh, pomegranate juice company. I can't recall their name, but that went on and on and on and on. And it just, you know, and by the time they got to the end, um, you know, I'm not sure anybody won or lost, but the cost of that company of just trying to defend that action was so severe that whatever benefit they got out of it, you know, was, was pretty much quashed by the cost. 
Um, and so insurance companies are, you know, cognizant of that. They understand that. And it's, it's a, a difficult risk for them to handle. Um, so what can you do? Uh, well, that's part of the decision. Do you want to be in those markets? Um, you know, with the California law, you really don't have a chance, a choice if you're in the U S you know, you, you pretty much got to deal with California. Um, you know, but with the GDPR in Europe, you know, that is part of that functional question. And, and for some companies, and you look at the larger companies, you know, particularly the newspapers, they have limited channels of revenues. Uh, you know, as we all know, newspapers have a hard time, you know, making money. And you've seen so many of them fail. Well, how do they make money online? And a lot of their revenue um, designs are based on cookie cookie technology, web beacons, those kinds of things. Well, in Europe, that's very hard to pursue. That's a very hard channel to comply, get compliance with and everything else. And they really just, it's very difficult for them to comply. And so they just made the decision, well, forget it. We'll block the EU. Um, you know, we can't afford to get out of this revenue channel. There is no other revenue channel for us that's going to make us money. Uh, and so that's part of that decision. So you need, you need to think about those things. Um, you know, I've had people contact me and they, it's literally that situation. Well, how many sales do you have in Europe? You know, five. Well, <laughs> you know, I know you want to be everywhere and that's the idea of the internet, but. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, here's the thing with you now, with the California, uh, uh, you know, new privacy law, is that only for uh, entities that are established in the state of California? that really applies to so if somebody is from new york you know texas or any other state uh they still have to abide and be compliance with california uh, if the customers live in the state of california yes if the customers are there and we get back into the nexus argument that i'm sure you're intimately familiar with from the sales tax issue nightmare yes yes sir. Yes, exactly. So we get into this grand debate about what's a nexus or not. And California is trying to say essentially, you know, one sale into the state is a nexus, um, which many states take that position. And then, of course, there's going to be yeah, quite a few lawsuits over what, whether that's actually true or not. You know, the Wayfair decision that the Supreme Court issued, which, you know, validated the state uh, sales tax, you know, it was. It, it's difficult. I mean, in some ways, it was a good decision. In other ways, it's difficult because it really forces each state to come up with some kind of a threshold. And if they don't, you know, then it sounds like from the decision, the Supreme Court would not be receptive to the collection of sales tax because it would be too burdensome to small companies. But nobody knows what that threshold is. And each state, of course, is doing something completely different, which makes compliance, you know, perhaps more burdensome than paying the, the tax. Um, so. It's almost like mission impossible. And I don't blame some of my clients. I really don't, Richard. And, and I, like I said, I... I'm very neutral about these things, you know, even though this is my profession, uh, you know, I, I tell my clients, I want you to stay in business, not go out of business. Right. And, and I'm going to be very upfront about this because I do express my, my opinion quite often. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm not afraid of that. Uh, I was born in this country and I think we have the right to speech. <laughs> so I, I definitely going to take this opportunity. Um, but I will tell you that I feel that um, it's a lot of burden into the e-commerce business right now. Um, and it states me to kind of, um, you know, step back a little bit. It, 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 if you really want to impose these new laws, then by all means, make it as simple as possible. Okay? Yes. Simple. Unfortunately. Because if you make it complicated, people are not going to follow. I hate to tell you that. It's just the way it is. It's human nature. Make it as simple as possible. And, and, and I know they tried many years ago to do what they call a flat rate, uh, you know, sales tax across, you know, uh, e-commerce. And that didn't work because, of course, you know, we had states like California and saying, oh, well, we want, you know, our, you know, our, our state tax and plus our local tax. And then, you know, other states started coming out complaining about it. Instead of complaining, you know what, come to a conclusion, make it simple, do a flat rate, let everyone just pay one single flat rate. And, you know, don't worry about local tax. Listen, if I pay California, and I'm sure you know that California, one of the most expensive local taxes is Sacramento. So, I mean, you could have state tax 4% and then Sacramento has another 4% or something like that. I mean, that's like, wow. So not only you have to worry about the state tax, now you have to worry about the local tax. Right. <laughs> so, and this is too much for these people. I mean, even myself that I'm trying to stay abreast of all these changes. I mean, we have 41 states like for Amazon, which I have uh, some of my clients selling that channel. For example, 41 states that, uh, you know, that have been already, you know, into the Amazon law where they have to, 
you know, um, they coming up with their thresholds and telling Amazon, no, you need to start complying with us and giving us uh, your seller's information. Right. <laughs> This is crazy. Um, so, you know, helping, you know, customers and helping these companies grow because as you know about history, Richard, and, and I will share this really briefly. I mean, you know, when, when we came to the United States of America, I mean, we were all colonies before, right? Back in the 18, you know, hundred. And, and the thing was that it was a free, uh, you know, a, a, what we call tax-free interstate commerce. What happened to all that, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so you know where I'm going with this. Um, so, you know, the famous ICC clause, right? That, that you know, supposedly that this is why we all came together, you know, because that way we didn't have to deal with these kind of, uh, you know, complex and limitations when it came to taxes. So I think putting so much pressure to all this in, in e-commerce, it's really going to hurt, you know, some of these e-commerce because they're really not making, some of these are not making really tiny, tiny profit, okay? after you take into account the cost of goods and everything else. And then on top of that, all these other new laws, <laughs> I mean, new privacy laws and everything. So going back to the California, just to kind of uh, touch, uh, you know, some of the, the, the main points here in, in recap. So if you're doing, so even though you might be in another state, and let's say for an example, I'm selling from Florida to California, I need to make sure that by the time, obviously California decides to finalize their law, but would I have to have a specific privacy policy for those consumers in California that are purchasing from me, correct? Uh, yeah, well, it would be embedded into your overall privacy policy um, because right now for other states, the requirements for privacy policies are, are very limited. So it would be one big privacy policy, essentially. Um, you know, if you are located in California and you had more than 20 employees, then you would also need a secondary policy. But yeah, and generally speaking, um, it, it, you know, it'll just become one big policy. And what you'll see is, you know, the policies that are out there now will be you know, radically replaced by what essentially is a new kind of template. Um, you know, and you go through and, and list, you know, the various different things that are required from, from the new law. But yeah, it, so it's not going to be something separate per se. Okay. Um, with clients that I have that are also combined with the GDPR, you know, I've been able to pretty much just mash it all into one, one large privacy policy, um, you know, and, and that will cut it. Unfortunately, you know, it's kind of counterproductive because if the privacy policy is so long, you know, nobody's going to read it and <laughs> we get into those kinds of issues. But I agree with you on the burden. You know, that's why I refer to this now as the Empire Strikes Back period of time. Um, you know, one thing they did in Europe that I thought was helpful um, that maybe they'll do in the U.S. is, you know, with VAT, VAT was so complex and such a mess. And then they came up with that one. Um, I forgot what they call it, but they have basically like one center where you pay in the money and then they distribute it to the various uh, right. countries. Exactly. Yeah. Which I think actually makes right. sense. Yes, yes. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proposing here throughout my podcast and, and everything else. I can, you know, express my opinion, uh, you know, online that please make it easy, make it simple. I mean, uh, you know, there's no need for complexity. Enough that we have to deal, you have to deal with the complexity as an attorney and I as an accountant, I have to deal with, you know, the taxes <laughs> and everything else, but for, for, for the businesses, make it as simple as possible. And that's what I was kind of bringing up because if the United States is going to try state by state, because like I said, I know California is one of those big, big, powerful states. That is the truth. Um, and you know, when they come up with something, other state will kind of try to duplicate or make a copy of that. So I can see this going in the next five years happening with different states trying to create a privacy policy too, right? Yes. So now, like you said, what are we going to have? 20 pages <laughs> for each state? Oh, this is for California. This is for Florida. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, incredible. It is. No, you're absolutely right, and I'd love to tell you if it's going to be anything other different, you know, different than that. And you know, the honest answer is no. It's going to be a boondoggle. But we have to wait to see, definitely, because there's still some changes, um, you know, taking place. And like you said, this is not effective. And now you even heard uh, the recent news that it might be a six more months. However, folks, please realize as you listen and watching, you know, uh, you know, our interview that. You know, uh, once it gets implemented, you need to be up to date with the compliance. That's really what matters. So right now you might have a little leeway, but still be prepared for it and reach out to Richard because 
uh, he has expertise to help you and especially to draft this type of privacy policy and hopefully they can cover you can cover also the GDPR because a lot of my clients they're selling overseas and they're not realizing um, that a lot of times they're collecting a lot of information right so sure. this will come very handy where you can create now for for the European GDPR uh, uh, privacy would you need to create a separate draft just for that with their terminology and all the clauses over there um, it depends on you know exactly what you're doing with information gathering and usage, but generally, um, you can either create one or you can you can have one privacy policy that then has subsections on other pages, like you see with Amazon and PayPal or PayPal, uh, Apple and groups of like this sort. Um, it just kind of depends. The goal, you know, the the goal is not to make it so long, you know, that nobody's going to read it. Um, but you know, to be honest, once you start getting into all these things with a privacy policy, most people aren't gonna read them anyways. <laughs> no, Richard, I, I'm gonna make a joke out of this. And like I said, I always try to have a good sense of humor out of all those things because honestly, I mean, I, I mean, between, you know, laws and taxes, I mean, really, it's, it's sometimes a, um, it's a headache. Uh, but, and we have to deal with it. But uh, the reality is that I think they should come up with like some sort of audio file. <laughs> Instead of the right, yeah, I mean, still having a right, and don't get me wrong, okay? <laughs> but how where people can click and they can actually listen to the terms? Because honestly, I mean, I don't know about you, but I know myself, okay? When I have all these, you know, privacy policies and I look down and I see five pages, do you think I'm going to take the time to read that? Absolutely not. Um, I might, my eye will be caught into certain parts of that privacy policy. Um, but, and then I have to sign, no matter what, at the end I have to sign if I really want the service, right? Um, so, create an audio. <laughs> actually, actually, you're not far off, a couple of clients and I, we've talked about videos. Is that right? Oh my Doing God. it as a video presentation because, um, you know, you're absolutely right. See, with a lot of the clients, you know, we talk about trying to make it proactive instead of reactive. So, you know, instead of, you know, grudgingly, you know, disclosing this information. What if we, you know, use it as a unique selling position advantage compared to competitors? You know, let's get out there. You look at Zappos. You know, Zappos customer service is infamous. You know, they're they're famous for that. Even the CEO has to spend you know weeks doing customer service to get a feel for their customers. Right. Well, what if we try and turn privacy into you know a positive in that sense? And yeah, a video or something where people would actually you know be able to understand and would actually you know gain that information because you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 25 years. I have Apple products. I have never once read any of the Apple things, even though they make you agree to them every three days. Never once have I read it. Um, you know, and that's that's the nature of it. And I think that's the nature of the web in general. People are moving away from text and more towards video and audio. So you're not you're not far off. And I think that we are going to see that. I, I think that it makes sense. You know, the only question from the legal side is some of the lawyers, myself included, get a little nervous about. Well, you know, if they come with a complaint, you know, how do we actually show that, you know, we, we met these requirements because you have the Americans with Disabilities Act issues, you know, what if somebody's blind, what if they, you know, they have hearing impaired and things like that. Well, sort. they need to have a caption in the video, right? They need to have the, the spelling out the information. And then at the end of the video, all they need to do is click yes. Well, yeah, I, that's, I, I agree. I think that's where, where we're headed. Yeah, you know, the concern that we have is, which I think you've also pointed out, is we have so many different legal requirements now that we're, we're quickly approaching the warning label on the mattress situation where, you know, it just becomes, you know, it just everybody's eyes kind of glaze over until they get to, you know, wherever it is they need to be. If you, I'll be honest with you. If you followed every law in the United States, every state law on the Internet, when people logged on to your e-commerce site, they wouldn't see your site they would see 50 pop-ups of warnings and disclaimers and here's where we're located. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, there does need to be kind of a Not national good for business. Not good for yeah. business. Do you think as a consumer, if I have all those pop things coming out and they're showing me, okay, you need to sign for this. You need to, say, I'm going to run the other way. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, seriously. I mean, so I think that, but you know, I like your point about creating the video because really I, I uh, like I said, even as a professional, I, 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 yeah, maybe you and I, I mean, as professional in, in this kind of field, I mean, we probably look at certain clauses, right? We just like cancellation, right? You look at right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, you know, uh, maybe something about how, what you're going to do with information. I've always been very careful about that. Don't share with third parties, yada, yada, yada. I mean, it's funny because even when I started almost nine years ago, 
in my business, Richard, I actually have my privacy policy on place on my website. And it's actually anybody could click and print my privacy policy. And before I even engage in business with anyone, I don't care how small, I don't care whether it's just a tax advisory consultation, I want you to sign my privacy policy. Well, you go quite a bit farther than most people do. Um, you know, to be honest with you, it's, 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 you know, I mean, that's definitely going much farther than most people do in the U S you know, where again, it's not really, you know, all that, that, that many requirements, although there may be professional requirements. Um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out because we're reaching a point where, you know, you're absolutely right. It becomes so burdensome and so over the top that it, it starts impacting, you know, not only people's ability to do business, but their ability to launch a business. And you look at Europe, you know, name the top 20 internet companies in the world. None of them are in Europe. And one of the reasons for that is if you're an entrepreneur in Europe, the first thing you do is leave Europe <laughs> because the burden of regulate regulations and things of that sort is such that, you know, that it's a horrible place to start a business. Yeah. It just is, um, you know, and their, their emphasis is more, you know, on, on they tend to view businesses very poorly. Right, except um, for Ireland, right? Because it's 12% corporate, so maybe... Right, yeah, yeah, but even Ireland's, you know, getting so much blowback now. Um, for people who aren't, aren't familiar with Ireland, Ireland issued, you know, they looked at their regulations and they issued advantageous rules and laws and things of that sort to try to attract American companies. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, is Apple the one that they have in the big tax dispute with now? And right. you have the, the EU suing Apple and Ireland suing the EU, and it's, it's hilarious. Um, yes. But yeah, you know, well, you know, a lot of people for the GDPR picked Ireland as their supervisory authority because you're supposed to select one. And the, you know, the running joke in the legal circles for a while was the supervisory authority in Ireland was three guys in one of the pubs, you know, and they didn't have a phone. And <laughs> no, I haven't heard about it. <laughs> so. Yes, they were they were not not particularly aggressive. So, um, but unfortunately, it looks like that's starting to change. So, Richard, before we wrap up the, the, this amazing, you know, uh, conversation that we have, you know, had so far, I mean, and thank you so much for all your information because, like I said, I'm grateful when I have phenomenal, you know, guests like yourself that brings so much value to, to my share. Really, I'm really appreciative for that. Um, I, one last thing I wanted to ask you is, what would you recommend, if you can, I know sometimes that's kind of a tough word. Um, uh, well, recommend or suggest, I'm not saying advising, right? Legally, that, that's a big uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what would you suggest someone who's starting a business in especially e-commerce, and they're going to be dealing with multiple states, and yeah, yeah, we know the problems with the sales tax and the nexus and, and all these policy. What do you think it might be the best entity right now as it is? Uh, you know, from my view, it really is, it comes down to two issues, what the individual state is requiring, um, where you're located typically, because the rules are going to be different. California, you know, we have an $800 annual tax. Oh, uh, see, yeah, right. that's nice. Right. And, you know, so there are different, different views as to whether S corps or LLCs are the best choices. So I think it depends on, you know, the particular states. I, I'll be completely honest with you. I don't view the distinction between LLCs and S corps from a legal perspective as significant as other attorneys do. For me, it's mostly a tax question. You know, what's going to be most advantageous to you from a tax perspective. Um, and then I can deal with the legal sides on either entity. The S corp is a little more, you know, a little more formal, does require things, but in the day and age of templates and printing off your internet, it's not a huge issue. From the legal side, the biggest issue uh, is really that you get a founder's agreement because if you have multiple people that start the business statistically, one of them is going to be a screw up. Um, and That's the problem that you, yeah. And the problem you run into is, you know, if you're launching the business and one guy's not carrying his weight, how do you get, how do you deal with that? How do you get rid of them? Wait, if you don't have a written document that details that, you're gonna, the only way to get rid of them is to go to court. And uh, so you're going to have a judge who's trying to decide what to do with the ownership of your business, who knows nothing about your business, and it will almost always kill or, or critically injure the business. Um, so you want a process in place before any money's coming in that says, okay, if any of us stop showing up, <laughs> you know, we can, we can be booted. And, and if you don't, typically what will happen is most people can't afford to go to court. So they end up running a business and they have a zombie partner. They just try to minimize the negative aspects of them, but that person still gets a piece of profit. They still get, you know, revenues out of it and nothing will make you matter in your life than paying a zombie partner money <laughs> for doing nothing. 
That is, um, <laughs> that is so, true. Yeah. Um, so from a legal perspective, that is by far for me the biggest issue. As far as you know, selecting the entities, you know, that's really to me mostly tax. Yeah, it is tax in, 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 in legally in the sense for, you know, I've seen like, especially again with e-commerce um, businesses uh, selling in Amazon, eBay, right? right? I've seen a lot where foreigners, they come here, right? And the first thing that they do is um, they get a new citizen or resident and they open an LLC because it's just like this trend with L limited liability companies, really. And I tell a lot of people, you know, from the legal you know, standpoint, I cannot give you an advice. And that's why I have people like you that can really, really come in and help them so much. I said, I can only talk and give to a limit of how much I can really advise you, you know, tax wise, because sure. I, have, I have a limitation too to that. Now, the fact is that, that, that what I tell people is you need to look at both. What future you're looking at, right? Five years from now, from the time that you're starting, um, and how many partners, like you say, you have? I think that in um, operating agreements, uh, special um, uh, loan agreements, capital agreements, whatever it is, this is so crucial for any anyone, anyone who's planning to partner, you know, into a business to protect themselves. Because at the beginning, everything is rosy, right? Um, and uh, <laughs> it, you know, everything we're all happy, we're excited, you know, we have all this high energy and everybody's bringing something positive to, to, to the table, right? But then when things don't work out the way we hope them to be, right? The hope and the wish is not good enough, right? Uh, then what happens is that then now there's starting to be some uh, disagreements there. And if you don't have a piece of paper, right? Sign that tells you how to exit that partner or how to solve, you know, the, the, the entity and all that, you can find yourself in a very, very ugly predicament. You really can. Absolutely. It's, it's a bad marriage. relationship. <laughs> it, is. it is. It is. It's a bad marriage. It's a bad it marriage. It's literally a bad marriage. It is the number one problem that we hear about from, you know, different businesses that call up. And it's, you know, I've got a partner who hasn't shown up for two weeks, you know, <laughs> uh, you know partner who's taking money out of the business. Uh, you know, all, all kinds of nasty, nasty stuff. And I yeah. those stories too. Yeah, it, it's sad. So again, folks, the main point is that we have, you know, Richard, an expert in, 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 in you know, business entity. And, and, and not only that, he can help you, especially in California with all these new privacy laws. And by all means, I, I know that sometimes as a small, you know, business owner, maybe you started with, you know, small capital, perhaps you have budgeted yourself for other things such as marketing, but don't forget the legal side. Don't forget the accounting side. We need to budget for those kind of things when you start a business, right? And the reason behind that is because I don't care how many sales you do. If you get into a legal issue, I mean, a lot of that revenue can just disappear like that, okay? So I think it's so much worth putting every dollar into, you know, structuring well your entity. You don't know how many times, Richard, I talk to people. And the first thing I tell them, I say, okay, uh, who is your attorney? All right. Who helped you to set up your entity? Who did you consult with before you decided that a C corp, an S corp, or part? What is it? And they're like, "Oh no, I, I just went online and I, I did it, you know, through whatever, you know, legal Zoom or whatever other websites they're using." And I asked, "See, that's where the issue is, because okay. you do need help. Because here's the thing." Most of the times, and I'm serious about this, Richard, and I'm sharing this openly to, to all my audience. And, and listen, I, I get it. I really do. I understand that some of us, you know, like I said, we don't have that much capital, and some of them are really starting, you know, almost from scratch. Um, but there's certain things that we can cut corners and others that we should not. We really should not. And one of them is how you structure your entity. Again, the agreements, how you hire someone to help you in, in, in the aspect of taxes, how they help you do, how to grow your business. These are things that are necessity uh, to cut headaches in the future. So folks, please, that you're listening to, you're watching this interview, reach out to people who can really help you. Um, like I said, I have brought amazing guests to my show to really help other audience out there, and especially my e-commerce business, because there's a lot of changes and it's gonna continue happening, right, Richard? I mean, I think this is just the beginning <laughs> of, of all the changes that are about to even arise in the next few years. Yes, I have to agree. Unfortunately, I think uh, you know we went through a long period of basic stability and growth online, and you know, yeah, unfortunately, the empire strikes back, and they're doing it now. So, it is time. Uh, 
yeah. going to have to deal with it. And Richard, um, before we wrap up, thank you once again for all this time. I know we kind of extended a little more of the interview than what we originally <laughs> talked about, but this is what happens when, uh, you know, two brains get together and we brainstorm something that, uh, you know, we, we want to give out so much information. Um, you, your, your website uh, and your contact information, that way people can reach out to you, please. Sure, you can find my website at SoCalInternetLawyer.com. It's very old school. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. It's Richard Chapo, C-H-A-P-O. Uh, you can always get me on there. I'm not really on Twitter, Facebook, or anything of that sort of the time. Uh, but in between those two, uh, two avenues, you can reach me. And uh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. It really has been. And I really appreciate your time and, like I said, all your knowledge because it is important. Your time is very valuable. So, Richard... I wish you a lot of success and thank you so much. And for all my audience out there, thank you for liking, sharing, and comment. And like I said, reach out. Um, again, I know that sometimes we want to, um, you know, have a little fist and hold our money and, 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 and not, you know, invest in other things. But this is really, really important that you structure your entity the correct way and that you have sufficient protection in case something goes wrong, which can always be very possible. Right, we hope for the best, but sometimes bad things do happen. Let's just be prepared, you know, and not sorry, because sorry is not going to help when we have a legal, uh, you know, situation in front of us. So thank you again, Richard, and everyone out there. Again, this is Liz, your host at the Tax Advisor Business Coach Success Podcast. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.